Kinsky. Okay, ready? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Hello, everybody. You're watching and listening to Wake Up with Patty Catter. Today, I have Bill Sturbansky with me. Welcome to the show, Bill. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Yeah, I'm so glad to have you on finally. I've been promising for Bill to be on my show for so long, and finally, it's happened. <laughs> It's been fun to watch you grow, though. It really has. It's been cool to watch this expand. Thank you. Well, actually, it's kind of good that I'm interviewing you now, right? Because we have more listeners. <laughs> there's there's perks. There's yeah. perks. Yeah, definitely. So Bill is a Marine Corps veteran, and he is a very well-known in the community of Sarasota attorney for military veterans. So Bill, first, I'd like you just to tell our listeners a little bit about where you came from and how you grew up. And we're just going to jump into your story that way. Sure, sure. So uh, I was born in Florida. Uh, I was raised in Sarasota, Florida. I went to elementary, middle school and high school here. Um, pretty typical kid in Sarasota. You know, back then it was much smaller. It was an itty bitty beach community. You know, we 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 spent times either at school playing on the beach mostly, um, and this is pretty much where I came from. So Florida grown one hundred percent. That's awesome. You don't meet too many people from Florida, actually. I've heard that too, and you know I always like to kind of jokingly respond, going like, "Well, I, there's a block party down the road if you want to go. We're going to hang out with a whole bunch of Florida grown people." <laughs> hey, tell me when I'll be there. Um, so, how about when you were a kid? What were you like? Were you outgoing? Were you quiet? Were you into things? Just kind of curious. Yeah. So um, I think if, you know, looking back, I think the best way I could describe it is I was an outgoing and pretty active kid, but, you know, I also had parents that supported that energy as well. And, you know, when I had questions or, uh, or interest in things, they would promote me checking them out and they would promote me looking into them first and then kind of them supporting my ideas. You know, I, I did everything from, uh, football to wrestling to going to visual and performing arts doing theater dancing singing and acting i was in a, a law academy program my freshman year of high school and then switched over to theater and then dabbled in football and and, and wrestling in um, high school as well but i i kind of considered myself as more of a social butterfly i liked talking to people i liked going to different high schools and getting to know those people and um, you know, different parties, different uh, gatherings. Uh, you know, I worked in Manatee County and I lived and I uh, went to school in Sarasota County. So I, I really enjoyed people. So I would, I think I would say I was more of an outgoing person. Mm -hmm. I would say so. I think that you were one of the first people that we met here in Sarasota area. Really? I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Um, you know, I can't remember exactly the very, very first time I met you, but I believe it was probably um, one of the events for military veterans in the area. Yeah. Probably like a Christmas party or something, um, maybe a pancake breakfast. I don't know. But, okay. Um, yeah, but I do remember you were one of the first ones that we met, um, at least one of the ones that I remember right off the top of my head, which makes a big deal too, because I mean, that's, um, I don't remember every single person I meet, but I definitely remembered you. Yeah. I've heard that a bunch of times. Um, and it's, it was always kind of my thing growing up is like, I, I just, I liked people, you know, I, I liked people and talking to them and figuring out where they came from. And it, I think that goes back to, uh, me really loving history on all levels, you know, where are they from? What makes them them? Um, so yeah, I can definitely see me running into uh, an event and then just talking to a bunch of strangers while all my friends are looking around going, oh, there goes Bill. I mean, bouncing from human to human. I mean, pretty sure that when I met you, you were bouncing around. Like literally, I just remember you like being so friendly and like, hey, who are you? You know, you made everybody feel comfortable. I remember that. And every time I've seen you at events, um, you're always one of the first ones I look for because sometimes I get, uh, I don't admit this often, but sometimes I'll get intimidated with a room full of people and I don't know anybody. And I walk in and I'm like, oh man, is Bill going to be here? Because he breaks the ice for everybody. So yeah. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so tell me about this. I know that you are a Marine in the Marine Corps and you are a Marine veteran. You're never a prior Marine. You're always once a Marine, always, always. <laughs> always a Marine. Um, did you know when you were a kid that you wanted to join the Marines? So that's an interesting um, question. No, the answer was, is I remember 
I remember kind of having an open mind as a child and um, wanting to kind of experience things. So my first exposure to the United States Marine Corps was my uncle was um, a, a mortarman in uh, the first Persian Gulf War. And he came to my elementary school class after that uh, war had ended. And um, he talked to the kids. And I remember standing next to him. He was in his camis. And I remember standing next to him and just being like, oh, my God, this dude is so cool. Um, but it didn't, I mean, I just knew that it didn't, it, it wasn't something that, um, uh, changed the course of time, if you will, but going through middle school, playing all sorts of different sports, um, then going into high school and trying to figure out who your identity is and, um, trying everything you can as much as possible. Um, naturally the biggest element for me was when nine 11 happened. Now I knew, before 9-11 that I didn't want to go on to um, higher education. I knew I wasn't ready for that. I knew I needed to go back out into the world and kind of explore things. And we had family that lived in Central America. So that was an option in the back of my mind. Or we had family that lived in the Northeast that, you know, I didn't know very well, but that would have been an option as well. Or just grab a job and go, you know, try to figure, save some money and bounce around as kind of like a, a with a wanderlust mentality. But when 9-11 happened, um, that was a very definitive moment. Um, you know, we all have our stories. We all can remember the exact second, the exact place, the exact feeling. Uh, most stories say like, what am I watching? Is this a movie? Is this even real? And then you see that second plane hit and it, it chills down your spine, um, just send shockwaves. So at that point in time, with understanding, coming from a military family and having this military background, that pretty much became a priority. Now, what branch did I want to go into? I actually walked into the Army Recruiter's Office first. What? I walked into the Army Recruiter's Office first. Um, funny story. Uh, I decided to dip out of school that day and go to the beach because that's what the beach community was like back then. And I was with board shorts, tank top, and flip flops, which back in high school, everyone would have looked and said, oh, yeah, well, that's what Billy wears. That's what he, that, That's him. Um, and I walked into the Army Recruiter's Office and nobody was there. So I waited around a bit. And as I was leaving, there was, I'll never forget his name, Gunnery Sergeant Lawrenson was sitting in the recruit, uh, the Marine recruiter's office, which was much smaller, much lower budget, but with all sorts of like crimson and gold and bulldogs and guys in their dress blues and just all over the place. There was all sorts of um, trinkets and uh, Marine Corps memorabilia. And he sits me down. I was 17 at the time. And he says, uh, you know, what are you doing? And I'm like, well, I want to I want to join the military. And he goes, I just saw you come out of the Army office. And I was like, well, I figured I'd go talk to them first. He goes, well, what do you want to do over there? And I was like, well, I was thinking about medicine, you know, maybe something medical. And he goes, well, we don't get we don't have medicine in the Marines. We get our corpsmen from the Navy. And I'm like, corpsmen? He goes, but I have another opportunity for you. I started talking about infantry and things like that. And I knew that on that day I was committed to making a decision. So I just made a decision. I was like, I'll do it. And he goes, how old are you? And I'm like, I'm 17. He goes, well, I need you to take this to your parents and get them to sign it. And it was the emancipation form. <laughs> so they had to emancipate me so I could go back and sign. And I remember looking at him and I was going, and I'm going to paraphrase this because I don't remember it completely, but I'm like, you know, this, this seems a little quick. I mean, I think I've only been in here for like 10 minutes. And he looks at me and this, with this weird question, he goes, you ever joined the Marine Corps before boy? And I'm like, uh, I think the easy answer is no. And he goes, good. If it's no, then how do you know how quick it is or how slow it is or something along those lines? And I remember just sitting there. I'm like, this guy's got an answer for every question I have. He must be, he must be God. So I took the paperwork. I went home and I told my parents about it and my mother and father, my dad was really cool. He was like, you know, obviously it concerns me, but you're going to be 18 in any day now. So I'd rather support my son uh, than, say otherwise my mother who was like well you know i always support you but i will have a couple questions for that drill that uh not drill instructor um that recruiter and i remember my dad and i were like oh my god <laughs> can we skip the question part mom and anyways it was a smooth process and um i was in delayed entry program until i finished my senior year and um i went in with a really good friend of mine my one of my best friends if not the best friend he's like a brother to me um and uh we went in July, 2003, uh, we signed up for the infantry. I did a stint in security forces and, um, a lot of those guys that we went in, uh, you know, they filled the spots of those Marine units that were coming back from the invasion in March of 03. And a lot of those folks, you know, they're not here. And, um, my four years from 03 to 07, 
after I've listened to hundreds, if not thousands of veteran stories, I have found that um, I'm very lucky to be here and uh, I'm thankful that I'm here. Mm -hmm. I'm thankful you're here too. And you're definitely here for a reason. Um, so those of you who are lucky enough and fortunate enough to know Bill, you know about all of his advocacy work that he does. And um, for the listeners out there who are civilians or people who've never been in the military or known anybody in the military, um, the sacrifices are real. And um, when I have veterans on the show, some of them will talk more openly than others about some of the things that they've been through. But um, because of your experience, Bill, um, is why now you're helping veterans. Is that right? It is. It is. It was, um, you know, going back to the love of understanding humans um, and the history that we create, I think is what spurred that desire. So, you know, the first thing that I remember was um, metaphysically how how quick someone can be taken from you, but what the cost is to even make that person. So, you know, I, I think of a good friend of mine that we we did lose overseas that, you know, I met, he was an older, an older Marine. Um, he, uh, he went through college and then he decided to enlist. Um, so he was the old man, even though he was in his twenties, but we were all, you know, younger than him. And um, I remember, you know, being enamored and, and falling in love with this other human being, like he was my brother now. And I remember the day that we lost him, it was within seconds. And I remember thinking to myself, wow, it, it took 25, 26 years for this human to be a son, to be a brother, to be a friend, to be a father, to be a lover, to be uh, a Marine, to be everything. But it took a blink of an eye and he was gone. And it never made sense to me. It, like I couldn't, I couldn't like wrap my mind around that. And I think that that was one of the first big changes um, that spiraled into another belief that when I left the Marines and was discharged, it was a, in a completely different reality. You know, the, the civilian world is not the normal world that we call normal. The, the world that we lived in, you have, you know, you have this huge spectrum of beautiful, positive things on one side and horrible, horrific things on the other. And then everything in between and everything in between is that gray civilian world. And that's what people call normal. But we were chosen. Well, in some aspects, we were chosen. We were vividly you know, signing that dotted line and making that very strong 100% commitment to go live on this extreme side way over here. And we called that normal. So it's no different than when you try to go, when you run three miles in Florida and then you go up to Colorado and you try to run three miles up there, your body has to acclimate. The mind has to acclimate. And I think that when I came back, I was lost in the sauce. And that's where the advocacy part came in mm -hmm. is because I couldn't understand it. And um, internally, I think I was born with a gift of trying to boil down to the, to the most minute details to understand the whys. Mm -hmm. And um when I knew that I was lost and went through a pretty rough patch, I knew that there had to been but the majority of us were lost. And then when you can see it on the faces of other veterans, you know, I typically tell people you got about once you discharge, you got about three to six to nine months before reality gives you a swift kick in the rear. And then you feel disenfranchised. You feel confused. It's almost like your compass is spinning. And so that happened to me. And then I got to see it in other people. And that's where the advocacy kicked in is I survived my rabbit hole mm -hmm. and I had a good people help me with my rabbit hole. And I wanted to do the same. I wanted that awareness to be there. I wanted our brothers and sisters to realize you're not alone. You don't have to isolate. These are all the same feelings. These are all the same thoughts. They're just in different times of our lives and we're going to go through them and we've all gone through them already. So let's go through them together. Mm -hmm. That's powerful. Um, I was thinking I did not go through anything like you went through. Um, and as a military spouse of somebody who was in war and who had been wounded in war, I felt alone and kind of not sure of um, what was going on when Ken finally did medically retire from the military. So it's kind of 
funny, we've never really had this discussion before, but I remember going back home to Michigan and I literally, I felt alone. I can't imagine how the military veteran who went overseas and saw different things and experienced different things, um, had the different sights, the smells, the loss of friends that were right there when they were, um, you know, when they were killed. And I remember going to um, the local memorial for military veterans in the city that we were in. And I would just go there and I would sit and I would write and I would be alone. And then one day I just kind of started looking around and I saw these veterans that would come and they were sitting alone and I would just start talking to them slowly. You know, we all kind of just ended up having this bond. And it's interesting that you also said, you know, you felt alone and you, you just really wanted to help people. Um, you were a connector and knowing your personality from before when you were young and how you connect with people and you're talking, we're talking about how bouncy and outgoing you were. And then going through that trauma, I'm sure was extremely difficult but then to come out of it and to have something inside of you say, like, I'm still here for a reason, that is powerful. Yeah, it, it is. And, you know, it's um, it's a peak in the trough, you know, in a, a life is a peak in the trough. Um, and I think what happened is that sometimes people forget. So you you have your story of loneliness and so do I and so do every other human on the planet. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, we all feel like we're different in some aspect because maybe your story is um, a little more or a little less than somebody else's. So what we do is we do what we should never do is compare, mm -hmm. you know, because for there will always be people lesser and greater than yourselves. So but the feeling of loneliness is still the same emotion. I mean, it's no different than being cold. You still get, you know, your nose is numb. Your lips are chapped. You get the sniffles. Your fingertips or your toes go numb and you just want to get inside somewhere where it's warm doesn't matter if you're 20 degrees or negative 20 degrees, you still have these same feelings, but some people will say, oh, well, my cold was worse than yours because I was negative 20. Okay, whatever you win. Hey, get get them the trophy, get them the trophy. Yeah, right. um, but going back to loneliness. So what the, the peak and trough, like you were saying is, you know, you had this individual uh, um, with self-reflection, you had this individual who was bubbly and outgoing, goes into the military, has a metaphysical change, comes out, loses that, thumbprint of their identity and some of us continue to spiral down that rabbit hole for some reason and god willing whoever's upstairs gave me the wrinkle in my brain to at least recognize it mm -hmm. and i was able to turn it around and you know what happened that bubbly outgoing stuff that was a natural thing for me it honestly if i'm all if i'm if i'm truthful outside of all types of therapy it became my therapy um, you know, people will say uh, true veterans don't talk about it. I, I absolutely abhorrently disagree with that. Mm -hmm. I think that communicating with yourself and with others is the only way you're going to solve problems. And so talking about it, being vulnerable about it, looking at other veterans in their eyes going, hey, you know something? We're not supposed to say we understand someone unless we do understand someone. And I can tell you that I understand mm -hmm. that became a therapy. And I, frankly, I, I think the human race would benefit if more people would do that instead of, you know, hiding in the shadows or comparing inside their minds. So then they don't have the bravery to speak or the bravery to interact. But um, I, I think it's a very powerful thing to look at someone and say, I'm sorry that you were lonely. And um, it's good to see that you got past that. And um if you're lonely again, I remember being lonely too. And so I'm here in case you're lonely again. And I think that that's a really beautiful thing. It is. And um, you started this organization, SRQ Vets, specifically, I'm guessing because of all of that, right? Yeah. So, well, uh, the interesting thing about SRQ Vets is, and I'll go back to the history of the understanding of the military, which, you know, the, the reality is, is uh, the the tough reality is, is the military is used and needed by the politicians when they need it. It's an old man's game where young men play and die. Um, and it's it's disgusting. And to be frank with you, I think it is the purest evidence of, of failure as humans as a thinking animal. Um, and uh, I, I, have, I will continue to advocate that for this day. And people have asked me, do you want your kids to be in the military? And I go, it's their decision. But if they ask me, I'm going to go, I do not want you to have these scars that I have. Mm -hmm. um, uh, would I be proud if they served? I would, but I would still be very fearful. 
Um, SRQ Vets came about because when we got out, there was too much misunderstanding, too many disenfranchised veterans, and too much red tape to go through through the other organizations. And we just got tired of it. You know, we 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 kept hearing about the god awful reality of the VA, which still persists today. Um, we kept looking at other organizations where we had a veteran who needed help now, but it had to wait for a meeting or we had to take a vote on it or had to go through some red tape. And it was very frustrating. So we thought to ourselves, wait a second, the last true military veteran generation would pretty much have been the Vietnam War, who is stepping into the shoes of those from World War II, regardless of how the Vietnam veterans were wrongfully treated. They still had the courage to go out there and serve their communities, which, by the way, that, that is an honorable thing, and you need to wear that badge of honor like a Medal of Honor, because that is even tougher than coming home with support, and we had support. Um, I can't imagine that, but what we did is we created this organization to say, we're going to take care of our backyard first. We got tired of big organizations coming in, taking cash from affluent communities and gone. We got tired of the red tape. We wanted to get a veteran who needed help and solve it as quickly as possible. And we wanted to start a, a culture of, wait a second, people don't live forever. These Vietnam hard chargers, they're going to be pushing daisies soon. So who's going to be the next? And then we have to keep this culture with these families and this understanding of what the sacrifice means, what this giving means. What I don't want my kids to look at a veteran and go, oh man, that like bum veteran over there is just a grumpy war killer, dog eater, <laughs> baby, whatever. You know, it, I don't want that. There needs to be communication and understanding. So that's why we started. We started it to create a new culture, to take care of our own, show the world, take care of your backyard first before you take care of anyone else's. Um, and do something internally with our families, with our community. And you're doing that. I've been to your events. I see the the veterans that you're taking care of and that are taking care of you too, essentially. Um, it is. You know, um, I haven't met a better group uh, locally than SRQ Vets. So appreciate that. Um, and I, I met a lot of groups. <laughs> so can honestly say that. So, um, if you're listening, you might think, well, I'm not in the Sarasota area. Um, let me say that sometimes it's okay to support groups on scales that are maybe not a nationwide level. In fact, I really encourage it because the fact that um, I know for sure that they're actually helping and changing lives and um, really impacting the community and not like Bill mentioned, you know, just one and done kind of a thing. So if people want to support SRQ Vets, where would they go or how would they do it? Yeah. So we're a 501c3. Uh, we're hundred percent volunteer. The money that comes in stays within the community and goes back out to projects. Um, we have our website, www.srqvets.us. Um, we have a Facebook page and we also have a um, Instagram page. We put a lot of projects on there. Um, we kindly ask that people, if they want to, please give us an email and we'll put you on an email list because we'll get projects. I mean, it's any given time that on a Monday through Friday, we'll get a phone call to do a project and we have to put a team together quickly that can, excuse me, address that project or address that issue within as soon as possible. I mean, typically within a week, um, you know, we just did one, uh, a ramp build that I think came in for a handicapped veteran. It came in within like 48 to 72 hours. We had the team ready and built it that um, that Sunday. Wow. So, uh, but that's that's what we do. We, we got to take care of our own and show people how to take care of our own. Mm -hmm. I just feel like people are getting too disenfranchised and, 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 and isolated. You know, like the beautiful thing about the sad thing and beautiful thing about 9-11 was on 9-12. Or 9-12 mm -hmm. was really when everyone went like, wow, we are a community. Since then, it's there, there's all this, there's all this like isolation, this individualism, this this victimization, this you know I want mine and mine is the whole pie, and it's like no, never in human history has ever one human ever succeeded. I mean, look at the kooks that go up into the hills and live by themselves. There's a reason for that. Community is important. It's needed. Nothing monumental and important gets done by one person. It's always a team. So the, the, that's the idea here. And we've been doing it since 2014. 
and no one has been paid. And it's still the same group of guys that get together and enjoy the camaraderie and enjoy the act of giving. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. Amazing. It is beautiful. So everybody, if you're listening again, Bill, one more time, social media. Yeah. SRQ vets, um, social media. So SRQ is our airport code. Vets V E T S uh, dot us, um, Facebook page, Instagram, check us out, you know, look, shoot us a message, ask questions. You know, we're not perfect and we're all volunteers. So please, we're all volunteers. Everyone's got jobs and everyone's got families and we do the best that we can with what we have amazing thank you again and if you're listening and watching right now you're gonna not want to miss next week's show because bill is going to be um actually we're staying in recording um and we're gonna do one more episode so next week the episode about how bill actually is making a big impact for military veterans and their claim work so uh, we're gonna talk about that next so stay tuned